Hello, this is Professor Keen. In my last lecture, I wrote down for you the contemporary way that Newton's universal law of gravitation is expressed mathematically. I've reproduced that here on the screen, the force of gravity that attracts uh, one mass to another is equal to the universal gravitational constant, capital G, times the product of the masses of those objects divided by the distance between the centers of those objects squared, or more precisely, the center of gravity of each of those objects squared. I also explained how, despite the fact that this implies a different force that is acting on an apple and a lead block that are both held, uh, let's say, at at uh, the height of six feet above the surface of the Earth, although those two objects will feel different forces of attraction toward the Earth by virtue of them having different masses than each other, they will, when dropped, fall with the same acceleration, neglecting air resistance, of course. Why do they fall with the same acceleration? Well, because although they feel different forces, they also have different masses, and so they respond to those forces differently in such a way that the mass on each side of Newton's second law cancels out, and so the acceleration that each of them feels is the same. If you want to review that, you can look back at my previous lecture. In this lecture, I want to do another problem that illustrates an interesting, I think, feature of the universal law of gravity. So here's the question I want to ask, and then we will answer this. So here's the question. How strong is the force that holds the Earth in its orbit around the sun. How strong is the force of gravity, of course, now, of gravity that holds Earth in its orbit around the sun? Okay, so, you know, we have the sun right here. Here's the sun. And we've got the Earth right here. And there's some distance between them, R. And the mass of the Sun is ms. The mass of the Earth is me. And, you know, Earth is going in this orbit around the Sun like that. So how big is the force of gravity that is attracting the Earth toward the Sun? So we want to compute this force of gravity that's acting on the Earth. Okay, how big is that force of gravity? Well, that's easy to do. We'll just plug in numbers into this. So the force of gravity that's holding the Earth in orbit is going to be g times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the Sun divided by the distance between the Earth and the Sun squared. Okay, and we can plug in. If you look up these numbers, the distance, 93 million miles, you'd probably have to convert that to meters. The mass of the Earth and the Sun, you have to plug those in, and G, you can plug that in. And if you do that, you will get something that is about 3.5 times 10 to the 22 Newtons. Okay, so we get that, but that doesn't really, I mean, that doesn't give us a feel. That looks like a huge number, right? But that doesn't really give us a feel for how strong this force is. All we can say is it's a huge force. But let's think for a minute about how that is compared to other forces. So let's imagine that instead of gravity, if somehow God were to turn off gravity, and instead we were to attach a steel wire from the sun to the earth, and that steel wire is what's swinging the earth around, it's providing this centripetal force instead of gravity, how thick or how wide of a steel wire would we need in order to produce the same pull on the earth as the sun does. How thick would it have to be so that that steel wire doesn't break? Okay, so to answer that question, we have to know what's called the ultimate strength. The ultimate strength of steel, a particular type of steel that I looked up. The ultimate strength of steel is 500 times 10 to the sixth newtons per square meter. What that means is if we have a steel wire, I'll draw a section of a steel wire, and you wanted to try to break this, the force you'd have to apply would be 500 times 10 to the sixth newtons for every square meter of cross-sectional area. 
okay? So if this was a one square meter cross section, it would take 500 million newtons to break that steel rod. If it was one square meter, if it was two square meters, then it would take 1,000 million or 1 billion newtons to break it, okay? So uh, this sometimes call is, so the ultimate strength is that this notice newtons per square meter that has units of pressure. So this is also sometimes called the ultimate pressure, pressure ultimate, how, how much pressure you need to apply steel in order to snap it. So we can ask a question is how thick, how thick a steel wire would be needed to produce this same gravitational force, the same gravitational force without snapping. You know, some, some force equal to this is going to need to be applied to hold this in orbit, but how thick would that steel wire have to be so that it wouldn't snap in producing that force? Well, to answer that question, so here's the question. Well, a force is equal to a pressure times an area. So we'll take this times the area. So we'll take the pressure ultimate, the ultimate pressure times the cross-sectional area of that steel and that has to give us this force of 3.5 times 10 to the 22 newtons and what we're really trying to do is solve for how big the cross-sectional area is and we're going to plug in this ultimate pressure right there and find what the area is and then find the diameter okay so if we solve for the area divide this by the ultimate pressure and when we do that we'll get about seven, I'm rounding off a little bit here, seven times 10 to the 13th square meters. Okay, and pi, what's the area of this? If it's a circular cross-sectional wire, pi times diameter over two squared equals seven times 10 to the 13 square meters. And if we solve for the diameter of this wire, we will find the diameter of the wire has to be about 9.4 times 10 to the third kilometers. Okay, to give you a sense of how big this is, we would need a wire with a diameter equal to about three quarters the diameter of the earth to produce that force and not snap. So you would have a situation where you've got the sun here the earth swinging around and the wire that you'd have to have that's made of steel in order to to not break would be have a diameter that is three quarters of the earth's diameter that gives you a sense of how strong the force is that's required to hold the earth in its orbit this is crazy the, there's an invisible force if you think about it this way there is an invisible force that is holding the earth in orbit that is as strong as a steel wire that has a diameter equal to three quarters of the diameter of the earth. And yet you can pass your hand through space. It's empty space and somehow there's this mysterious force that's being produced that's as strong as that thick of a steel wire. That is a fascinating way of looking at it. And you can see why people were a little skeptical about Newton's universal law of gravity and his approach to gravity that can produce such enormous forces across empty space. By the way, if we did this instead of for steel, if we use spider silk, if we made a wire of spider silk, the spider silk would actually need to be much smaller, much narrower. That's because spider silk Spider silk has an ultimate pressure that is a breaking pressure, which is about four times that of steel. So spider silk per cross-sectional area is much stronger than steel, which is, I think, a very interesting point to notice. Let me just say one final thing. 
point out something else about Newton's law of gravity. Um, notice that we've been isolating our attention to two bodies, like the Earth and the Sun, or an apple and the Earth. But technically speaking, every object that has mass pulls on every other object. So the Earth itself, the consequence of this is that the Earth itself is not in a perfectly elliptical orbit around the Sun because all the other planets are pulling on the Earth as well and giving it kind of this complex orbit. So let's consider the effect of the Moon on Earth's orbit around the Sun. Okay, so I'm going to draw the Moon and the Earth. So let's suppose I'm just going to sketch this. There's going to be no mathematics here. I'm just going to sketch the Earth at a few times in its orbit around the Sun. So the Sun is going to be over here somewhere. And then the Moon. So what's happening is the Moon and the Earth, I'm drawing a line, they're not actually connected. But the Moon is swinging around the Earth like this. Uh, let me draw one or two more here. Okay, so the Earth is going around the Sun and the Moon is going around the Earth and the trajectory of these are such that they are kind of dancing around each other as they're going around the sun. Okay, so they're technically speaking, both the earth and the moon are orbiting the sun. And as they're doing so, they're kind of swinging in and out. And it's the center of gravity of the earth moon system that technically speaking is in this elliptical orbit around the sun. And the Earth and the Moon are kind of swinging mutually around each other as they go around the Sun. So that's just an interesting way of thinking about it. And again, if every single planet, every asteroid pulls on every other one, so there's fairly complicated motions going on. But Newton's universal law of gravity allows us or provides us with a mathematical way of modeling the motion of all these heavenly bodies due to their action on each other.